Okay. Hello and welcome to our very special International Museums Day newsroom. Today we are joined by Lucy Davenport, who is part of our Digital Persona project. And we are really, really excited to welcome Tom Phillips from Moira Furnace today. Nice to, nice to see you both. And you, and you. That's good to be here, thank you. Brilliant. Now I'm I'm going to step back because Lucy has agreed to interview Tom for us today. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Lucy. Thank you very much. So just a couple of questions, but to start off, what actually is your role at Moira Furnace and what does it kind of involve? Uh, my role is site manager and it involves pretty much everything. Um, <laughs> You name it, I, I've done it. I mean, it's I, I'm in, in charge of the whole site, uh, in charge of all the events that we put on, uh, ultimate, ultimately responsible for the volunteers, uh, managing the volunteers, uh, responsible for the income generation, dealing with grants um, and that kind of stuff, dealing with outside agencies, third parties. And yeah, you name it, I, I do it. Um, I have just recently got an assistant um, and they'll be starting next Saturday, which is very exciting. And their yeah. main role will be to um, run the museum, the boat and the park when we're open and to manage the volunteers uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So it lifts some of the load off me, which means I can then look at the rest of, of that job, which will be uh, yeah. a load off. But yeah, that's what I do, everything really. Yeah, so you, do, so you do quite a lot, but what would you say your favourite part about your job actually is? My favourite part about the job is driving up the drive in the morning yes. along the edge of the ancient woodland with the furnace in front of me. If I ever get stressed in the office because of too much paperwork, I can go for a site walk where I just down tools and walk around the 36 acre site just mm -hmm. relax and breathe. And that way it helps me uh, keep in touch with what's going on around site. There might be might have been some vandalism, uh, there might be some litter, there might be something that's broken through wear and tear. And you know, we can have those to our jobs list and point the volunteers in the right way. I just love working in such a lovely place. And mm -hmm. joint top are the volunteers. The sheer energy and enthusiasm considering the majority of our volunteers are retired, which most volunteers are, because they're the ones that have the time. You know, they're, they're mm. still full of life and they give me a real run for my money. And I absolutely love it. Love being kept on your toes by them. Oh, yes. All the time. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's great. So um, I can imagine that the volunteers has had a bit of an impact over the past 18 months. But in general, what has been impacted by COVID over the past 18 months? What hasn't been impacted by COVID, really? True. Um, yeah. So it's, it's meant a real shift in what we've been able to do and how we've been able to work. Mm -hmm. uh, we rely or have relied and we, we still do get... Um, we have a service level agreement with the district council, North Westchester District Council, and as part of that, we get a grant, thirty-seven and a half thousand pound. It's it's out there. It's public knowledge um, because they own where are we? They own the uh, furnace building there. They own mm -hmm. some of the land, um, and it's leased out to us, and we manage it and run, run the museum. Um, so because we've got that, had that grant we weren't able to get business grants you know recovery grants um i wasn't able to be furloughed nor my former assistant so the trust have had to keep paying me so i've had to keep working i worked from home luckily uh, museum development east midlands um small grant fund had not long before this kicked off had supplied money to buy laptops so I could take a laptop home, my assistant could take a laptop home, we could work from home. Volunteers, I, we took the decision to, for them to stay at home until it was safe to come back. And so it's been very bitty and bobby with the volunteers. Yeah. Um, 
during the first lockdown, I was out on the ride on mower, doing all the lawn mowing, going around emptying the bins. So my role was very much a hands-on role. So, you know, I was yeah. doing what the volunteers do. I loved it, mine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's only uh, so many walks with the kids around your house and the area around there you could tolerate before going back. So this was a nice break. But then coming out of lockdown in the summer, it was, I, I know a lot of museums, they delayed and put off opening a bit until they were really confident they were safe to open. Um, but I managed to get us up and running by the start of August. Before that, we'd had a month and a half's worth of trading where we've managed to set up a takeaway tea and coffee service, yeah. um, which brought in some income, which is great. It's the on-site cafe. It's an independent cafe that they decided to, to not open until uh, July. So, you know, we we were making money. And by the end of the year, um, we'd actually made some money, which was just amazing. Yeah. Looking at all the rest of the, the museum and the heritage sector, lots of people reported losses. But I think the fact that we are a small organisation really mm. helped us we didn't have to worry about multiple sites. We didn't have to worry about multiple employees. It was just me and my assistant. And then come August, my, my assistant uh, moved on to a, another another job. So it was just me then. Um, so we only had to worry about paying myself. And the volunteers were itching to get back. So as soon as they were allowed to get back, you know, Imagine. is worth their weight in gold because it's free. You know, mm. it, it's brilliant and it meant that we could actually make some money. Going forward to this year, mm. we managed to open up on the 29th of March. We yeah. opened up running the Joseph Wilt, which is the boat you can see behind me. Because, uh, again, as you can see, the seating is open air. You can't get more COVID friendly than that. It's very well ventilated. And um, as well, if I... Uh, where I'm pointing there, that window there, we opened yes. up and put uh, some decking out the front and we used that as a takeaway hatch to sell teas and coffees and various refreshments. And Very it's nice. just gone, yeah, it's gone crazy. The cafe has only just opened up today. Um, mm -hmm. And in the interim, we have made thousands of pounds just for the, for the visitors visiting the site because they're desperate to get out and about yeah, you know, not the not the local walk that they've been doing every day for God knows how long. They, they, they just want to get out and about, and so we are nice and safe. We're open air, um, and we're very excited to open the museum this coming Saturday on the twenty second of May. Uh, yeah. Now restrictions have been lifted. We've got some reenactors from the eighteen fifteen era Napoleonic Wars. We've got an on site burger van. Uh, as well as a cafe and our refreshments and, you know it's things are slowly starting to to feel a bit more normal yeah um, so the impact has not been as bad as we thought but i think it's all down to quick thinking thinking outside the box and, and adapting i think that's yeah, the question yes yes it has <laughs> it has um, so today is actually International Museums Day and the theme is recovery and reimagine. How important is this to you, uh, is to it to museums, sorry, when it comes to engaging and interacting with audiences? The recovery bit, well, I've just covered that. You know, yeah. you have to, to bounce back. Um, I know there's now a shift in the museum and heritage sector uh, to thinking more of running museums and heritage sites as a business to ensure they're making money, not relying on the grants, because there's been a lot of grants that have been given out. And the mm -hmm. worry is, you know, that money's got to come from somewhere and it could dry up, very easily dry up. They, they could say, well, you had all these thousands, hundreds of thousands of pounds during the pandemic. We've got nothing now. So, you know, you, I have always run this site like a business. We are a charity mm -hmm. trust, but at the end of the day, if you're not making money, you can't then reinvest it into the site to do the jobs you want. You have to rely on those grants. If you can't get the grants, then, then you struggle. Uh, uh, for the reimagining part, um, it's really important 
it's something I try and get across to the volunteers that we need to change what's in our museum on a regular basis to attract people to come and look around or come back and return. Mm. It's not expensive to go around our museum. It's £2.50. It's not a lot. And you can go around within an hour. Yeah. But it's one of those. You go around, oh, that's nice. One and done. Go home. That, that's it. But as a museum, you want people to come back again and again and again, at least once a year. And so I've tried to rotate and change things. So this year we've we've changed where the canal uh, information is. We put that up in the bridge loft, so it's next to the iron working and that whole story of the industrial age and place all together. So the layout up there is slightly different. So if you come, we've got new interpretation boards as well. That gives a few new in, important facts that we've found out since the original display was done. Um, and then downstairs, we've got uh, a project all about the furnace families, the people who lived in this fantastic building um, a couple of hundred years ago, you know, the, the coal miners. And now we're doing a project on the people who lived on the site out the front called the Crescent, and we're charting this history from the 1920s all the way up to the 1980s, um, and trying to track down the families, and the people who live there get their stories. We've got loads of pictures of the place and the local area. We want their stories. Why did they move there? Why were the houses built? Who lived where? We already know the numbering system of the houses changed halfway through its life. It went one to 40 odd one way and then it changed and went one to 40 the other way. So we're getting people going, I lived at number 32. Like, well, which number 32, you know? Mm. And just trying to make sense of what happened. And that connects with the local community. And that's a project that will grow and develop over the next few years when we get more and more people in and we interview them and get their story. And we can change and put the different stories up there. So we're reimagining our museum on a constant basis to make it more exciting and interesting for the people who are coming in. And also looking at ways to interact with uh, children and young people and um we are hoping to get a big grant to completely redo the bridge loft. And so we can have a more interactive experience up there for the um, industry, industrial heritage exhibit. Um, but that's, that's a long-term thing, you know, we we'll look at next year for that. But again, that reimagining, uh, not just plodding on doing the same old thing, because people won't come back, they'll come back once. You don't want to make £2.50 out of them once and that's it you want them to come back yeah. the next year to see what's different and then the next year and then they come back and they spread the word and they go oh it's you know it's good there they keep changing and then their friends come and then you're spreading your story to, to more people yeah yeah definitely so sort of linked to the reimagining side um what are you looking forward to most over the next 12 months for the museum uh Looking forward to it opening this Saturday yes. um, and seeing people, yeah, yeah, seeing people actually back in the museum. It's already been great to see the amount of people on site increase. Um, mm. Looking forward to events. We've got craft fairs coming up. We've got motor clubs. We've got outdoor theatre. Um, all this um, stuff happening, but to get people in the museum so they can find out, discover the story behind this wonderful place where they come to watch a Midsummer Night's Dream, or they come to look at the cars that are here. So they, if they come back at the weekends and we're open and they can look around the, the museum, they, you know, they really get a sense and a feel of what this place was and how important it was and how important it is in the whole of Europe. It's the best preserved furnace of its kind in Europe. And I'm really excited to spread that word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just to round it all together, how can people actually keep up to date with what's going on at the museum? So we have a website, uh, moirafurnace.org. Um, so all the information is on there. Uh, also, the best place really is the Facebook page. Um, I've really managed to grow that over the past few years. Everything's on there. We have got an Instagram account, but that really gets updated. Uh, gets updated more than the Twitter. But again, we're on Twitter. You just look for Moira Furnace. We're on all yeah. three platforms. 
started making some short videos as well. And if you search for Moira Furnace on YouTube, you'll find it on there and you can find out a bit more about the site as a whole. Um, I know there's a few more exciting things coming up in terms of social media that uh, certain somebody might be involved in. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so check out us on Facebook, really, and our, on our website, and you can get all the information. And if you need any information, messages on Facebook, email office at moirafurnace.org, or find the phone number on the website, give us a call. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time, and thank you for answering all of my questions. Oh, thank you for having me. <laughs>